Okay. So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, do you hear me? So, uh, welcome everyone to uh, tonight's session uh, on CLL. This is part of the SSBMT webinar uh, ses sessions or series. Uh, before we begin, uh, we would like to give uh, special thanks to our speakers, uh, Prof. Cater and Prof. Graben, for accepting the invitation. Uh, also, a special thanks to uh, the company AbV for sponsoring tonight's session, uh, as well as to uh, Novartis and Takeda for sponsoring the, uh, the webinar series for the SSBMT. Uh, of course, uh, not to forget to mention the SSBMT group um, with uh, the head, uh, Dr. Ahmed Al Askar. Uh, these series have been very educational and helpful for the uh, hematology committee in Saudi Arabia and international as well. So I would like to uh, briefly go over the agenda of uh, tonight's session. Uh, we are going to have uh, two back-to-back -back lectures. Uh, each one will take about 20 minutes. Uh, at the end, we will have a Q&A session that takes about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, so please leave the questions till the end to the Q&A session. Uh, and then uh, when that session starts, you can uh, basically chat your questions in the chat uh, area. So now it gives me a great pleasure to introduce uh, Prof. Kater, who is a clinical hematologist who has a special focus on lymphoproliferative disorders, uh, particularly at CLL. Uh, he has been a staff member of the Internal Medicine Department and Hematology at the, uh, Amsterdam University since 2007. Uh, he also worked uh, in 2008 on a postdoc at the uh, Morris Cancer Center uh, in California, University of California, San Diego. Uh, since September 2014, he has been the chair of a Dutch CLL working group at the Hematology Oncology Foundation for Adults in the Netherlands, uh, Novon. He also recently became the editor of Hematologica. He's highly active uh, for the Dutch uh, CLL patient advocacy group, uh, giving lectures for patients and families, and has been awarded uh, many, uh, several uh, grants and prizes uh, for his research and work in CLL. Uh, so it gives him pleasure to introduce him uh, to talk about how I treat newly diagnosed CLL uh, patients. So, Prof. Kader. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I will share my slides now. Uh, it starts. Am I sharing now or not yet? I think I'm sharing now, right? And you see the and you do see the whole slide now? We can see them. Yeah, you see the whole slide, right? Yes, yes, bro. Exactly. Go okay, ahead. perfect. Okay, so I start. So thank you very much. It's a privilege to to speak to the the Saudi uh, society here for uh, on the topic of CLL and uh, how to treat newly diagnosed uh, people. I actually was looking up how many times our country and your country has uh, had a football match, and only it happens I think only one time in the World Cup of 1994, which we luckily won. But I think it was a very equal game with only two to one. And so maybe uh, we can make up for that tonight, and I hope to uh, address the questions uh, later in the session. Uh, well, if you look specifically to CLL, you see that it's a tremendous amount of, of, of new research, new developments happens, but actually only in the, in the last two, three years, actually. If you look until 2000, 2014, 16, it was mostly chemoimmunotherapy. 2015, 16, we got approved uh, the targeted agents, but if you look now to the treatment options, it's actually widening up um, even much more. Uh, with all these advantages, we also have uh, focused much more on uh, on diagnostic procedures that actually help you to to practice uh, in your in your clinical practice what kind of treatment you should choose. And although this was more hypothetical for a very long time, since we only had chemoimmunotherapy, so whatever you would find, your treatment would not change. Now that you have so much treatment options, it's really, I think, a, a new moment uh, tonight to discuss again which of those markers you really should do. It's more, uh, and which one is maybe more interesting to know, but not really relevant. So the data that I show now in the next three slides all discusses uh, what's happening prior to novel targeted therapies. And we know from this, that both a deletion of 17P, which harbors the, genes, the gene P53, this pivotal apoptosis gene, 
or if you have uh, not a deletion but a mutation or the other allele or you have missing both that really severely severely affects your outcome to chemo immunotherapy what you saw in this slide which is this older data sets much older data set is from terry hamblin who was one of the first uh, to discover that you have two types of CLL, as you might all know, you have the IGVH mutated and the IGVH unmutated, all based on the fact that there has been yes or no a germinal center reaction prior, perhaps uh, for the uh, development of the leukemia. And what we know already for more than, than, than 10 years is that those unmutated IGVH patients do worse than the mutated patients. And it's particularly true uh, prior to novel targeted therapies and the fact is how does uh, the question is how does this is this still a bad prognostic factor how should you implement this in, in your guidelines so if you look to chemotherapy uh we know that what however you do it if you do it by purine analogs fludarabine and pentostatin you get inhibition of dna replication if you give alkylating agents like benamustine for ambicil cyclophosphamide you give dna cross-linking damage and left or right they all create apoptosis and and that's actually how those drugs work and we have learned from a lot of trials in the past specifically the cla trial and but also the uk trials that addition of an antibody specifically rituximab uh, or as the germans have showed also the cl11 obinutizumab they really potent the effect of chemotherapy where we have at least we had three types now we only have two types rituximab and obinutizumab that all work either by direct killing or by complement derived killing or adcc and in the balance we have created is different chemo immunotherapy regimens that we use in CLL for fit patients, FCR and benamustine rituximab, so fludarabine, fludarabine cyclophosphamide rituximab, and for older patients, either chlorambicil rituximab and more effective chlorambicil gaziva or obinutuzumab. And the reason I stay a bit long on this slide is that we do know that all this DNA damage, the final goal is, is to, to activate the apoptosis pathway, which needs active TP53. A whole different paradigm in CLL is that we have discovered that uh, it's not so much difficult to clear the uh, blood compartment of CLL because we know those cells are pretty vulnerable. Now, I always like to compare this to a Formula One racing car, since I know also in Saudi Arabia, a lot of people of you like the sports. So we know from a uh, sports car, it's it looks a very like a dangerous car, but we know also that it's when it's driving in a circuit, it's extremely vulnerable. And the reason that the car does not explode, that all his tires stay there until the end of the game, is that at the right time, he goes back into the pit lane, as you can see here and there, he gets completely revitalized. And the same is happening, we know for CLL. In the blood, it has BCL2, a little package of anti optotic molecules to survive. But just before it dies, it goes back into this lymph node microenvironment where it's recharged by all these cells surrounding it. Uh, expression of other antiopatotic molecules go up like MCL1, B cell, XL, and from there it leaves again the pit lane and, and the whole circle starts again. And the finding that inhibition of this uh, migration and adhesion in the lymph node compartment created the development of these very powerful drugs called uh, B cell receptor inhibitors like BTK inhibitors, abrutinib and acalabrutinib, or PA3K delta inhibitor adalalisib. Important fact, what these drugs actually do is they close the pit lane, so the cells cannot go back here. And very importantly, this has nothing to do with P53, so this whole effect is independent of TP53. Since you do uh, inhibit the cells from going into the pit lane, but you don't kill the cells, we do now know that you need very long time continuous treatments. And although this might be not a big problem, because as we discussed later, the, the, the toxicity of these drugs are much milder than chemotherapy, it still creates this problem. It's like an older slide of relapse patients. So what we know from re more recent data is that for primary, for pre and primary patients, first line treatment, these curves look better, but the curves themselves look pretty similar. Patients continuing the drug will have relapse of the disease, the blue line, uh, the, the gray line, Patients will stop because of side effects. Specifically, if you use the drug longer, you get more side effects and more stopping. And a part of your patient will stop because of uh, transformation, although this is more what we see in the relapse setting than in the first line setting. So from our boot treatment, we know 
CR rates are very low. You hardly see patients with MRD negativity, but we still know that it's it's a very good drug with long time uh, progression free survival, but you have to treat until relapse. And the third class of drugs is a venetoclax, which is a drug that mimics BA3 only molecules. So just to remember, uh, normally you would have uh, a balance between anti-apoptotic molecules, mainly BCL2 and pro-apoptotic molecules like the BH3 only proteins. If you give chemotherapy, you get more BA3 only proteins, mostly Puma and Noxa. But what happens if you give venetoclax? It's an artificial BI3 mimetic, so you don't need any any uh, own BA3 only molecules. You give the drug, it pushes uh, the normal BA3 only molecules out of their B cell two pockets, and then you get activation of the apoptosis pathway. And also here, you it's kind of post P53, so it's also independent of TP53. So with this set, with this prognostic markers, P53 mutation uh, status, uh, cytogenetics, and mutation status, and with the three different classes of drug, chemo immunotherapy, inhibitors of, uh, of, of, of the B cell receptor signaling pathways, BTK inhibitors and PA3K inhibitors, and venetoclax, we have very recently got very important phase three trials that had to create all over the world a, a rewriting of the current guidelines. And I sit here uh, on behalf of Hovon and also on behalf of the ESMO. So I will build up this talk and at the end of the presentation, I will tell how we have changed the ESMO, the European guidelines based specifically on this phase three, this uh, few phase three trials that I will present here. So one of the very important trials that has been done is by Tate Schanefeld, uh, one of the two very large American studies that has been done, where abrutinib and rituximab, it's a combination of the two drugs, was compared with FCR. I will come back later if really there's a necessity to combine those two drugs, but at least this was fit patients, chemoimmunotherapy versus abrutinib rituximab. And I think most of you have seen the slide, so I only want to point out the highlights was that uh, uh, Ibrutinib Brutuximab had a better progression-free survival and a lot of discussions and debates, and perhaps we can discuss this also with John in the discussion, um, better overall survival was seen in a pretty short time frame uh, for the Ibrutinib Brutuximab treatments. But if you look to the different groups, you can say oh, that this unmutated IGVH patient that we know do worse on chemotherapy actually did better on Ibrutinib Brutuximab, but there was no clear difference for the group with mutated IGVH. And uh, I don't have it here on slide, but we also know that abrutinib is a drug that is working independent of P53. So patients with a DEL17P or P53 do, of course, much better on this combination. Well, how does it work with side effects? And you have to remember that if you look to side effects and you compare a regimen that is continuous treatment, so no stopping versus six months of treatment, that gives a very big blur in the data because side effects with FCR is actually only six months. For IR, of course, it is a much longer time. Having said that, you can see that most of side effects were more mild in abrutinib rituximab, although it's, although it's still uh, happening, three to five, Grade three in uh, of neutropenia, twenty seven percent of patients. Uh, anemia happened, but that's a, more low, a lower um, number of patients. And also, patients have died because of second malignancies. So, because I have a bit short in time, I not go too much deep on this, and I now go to the abrutinib and rituximab uh, plus minus rituximab versus benamustine rituximab. So, a little bit of older populations which were on, were thought not. Uh, uh, well fit for FCR. Treatment was either again abrutinib until progression, abrutinib plus rituximab until progression, or this classic regimen bendamustine rituximab for uh, six cycles again. And first take home message here is from this trial, I think we can make the conclusion that addition of rituximab, at least in the setting where you continue the drug, does not really help uh, because the abrutinib single agent versus the abrutinib plus rituximab were completely overlapping, and both had a better progression-free survival than the best metamastin rituximab. And again, the same picture here. For mutated IGVH patients, not a very clear difference has been seen, while for unmutated, you can see that uh, uh, abrutinib treatment seems to be the better drug compared to chemoimmunotherapy. Here, it is a bit important, I think, to look a little bit more to the side effects. So again, a 
more uh, more frail patient group to say, well, oh, the patient group was still not that frail, but compared to the first trial, the FCR versus abrutinib rituximab trial. And what you do see is that it, although abrutinib is this single agent drug, no chemotherapy, it's still a drug that, that you have to take care of, of, uh, of, of adverse events. Uh, so non hematologic uh, here you see a 74% versus 63% grade three or more AEs and death during treatment or per 30 days. And again, there's a big time difference here because six months versus long duration treatment. But those numbers do uh, differ and something that we should keep in mind. Third trial that's important is uh, a trial compared acalabrutinib plus obinutuzumab versus carambusobinutuzumab. And I think it's very important to mention in this trial that there was no arm included with acalabrutinib single agent. So from this, we don't really know if and how much abinutuzumab treatment really potent the effect of acalabrutinib, but it's the data we have to work with. Acalabrutinib is considered second, second generation uh, BTK inhibitor with perhaps a better efficacy. We don't know that. We still have to wait the trial that's continuous running already for quite some years. And it might be a bit, bit more safe with less uh, grade three to four toxicities. So if you look to this trial, uh, you could see that uh, compared to chlorambucil obinutuzumab, so this was an elderly frail patient group, that again, the treatment of uh, a continuous treatment was better, both arms, uh, so whether Akala alone or Akala in combination, versus chlorambucil obinutuzumab. And the fourth trial that's important is completely different. Now a trial was done by the Germans uh, combining venetoclax, so the BCL2 inhibitor, together with obinutuzumab versus uh, chlorambucil with obinutuzumab. And this trial is very different than the BTK inhibitor uh, trials. Why? Well, first of all, in the control arm, instead of six months of treatment to make it more equal, uh, the control arm, uh, 12 months of treatment was given, chlorambucil obinutuzumab. And second, now we have for the first time targeted agents without chemotherapy that had a fixed duration of treatment, 12 months and not uh, until progression. Why obinutuzumab? Well, we know from the UK, uh, sorry, from the Australian uh, phase two trials with venetoclax and rituximab, and also from the Murano trial, that the chances of getting MRD negative disease, and I think John will go much in more detail in the second presentation today. Um, is a very good surrogate marker for long-term progression-free survival, specifically after fixed duration of treatments. And that's why venetoclax with obinutuzumab was chosen here as a treatment uh, for 12 months of time. And again, if you see here, it's a bit all the same, but uh, same picture here. The older chemoimmunotherapy treatment, 64% of progression-free survival was seen at two years time points versus 88% of a patient that had venetoclax obinutuzumab. And also here, again, you see the picture that if you have an unmutated IGVH, uh, you see that uh, patients treated with chlorambucil, obinutuzumab did worse. All the patient groups with a mutated IGVH, whether they had venetoclax obinutuzumab or, or chlorambucil with obinutuzumab, the, the, the orange curve, they are much closer together here. And not surprisingly, what was also seen with the other trials, if you have a P53 mutation, either wild type or deletion, chloramicil plus obinutuzumab is really not a good drug to give. You're much better off with targeted agents, whether it's venetoclax, obinutuzumab, or as I showed earlier, uh, abrutinib. What you do see here though, is that still, uh, although this is targeted agents, and I said in the beginning, venetoclax is working independent of P53, and we can discuss later why this is, uh, but you do still see that there is a difference that patients with a P53 deletion or mutation first line, they seem to do worse on uh, venetoclax obinutuzumab versus patients with a wild type P53. Safety, well, venetoclax plus obinutuzumab is still does have toxicity, specifically neutropenias. That happens actually a lot. More than half of the patients had some uh, at three to four uh, AEs. It is important that the type of AE uh, of, of neutropenia is we think different than immunochemotherapy because you see that the numbers of feeble neutropenia is relatively low in the two arms. Uh, you do get tumor lysis from venetoclax, but with all the measures and the precautions that we take, this is at least very, very well taken. 
So I think I'm all at um, talking now for 20 minutes almost. So um, what we have to do now with these trials and how are we going to implement this in 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 our real patient day-to-day -day patient care? How are we going to discuss this with the insurance companies in within the Netherlands, but in Europe? And and how has this changed? And it actually has changed a lot of things and it has changed tremendously. If you can see on this slide, we had the ESMO guidelines, the old ESMO guidelines, which were actually not old at all, but they have to be changed. We changed them. Uh, at the end of last year. So what we had first is uh, only a division between yes or no P53 aberrations, so no del 17 p or yes, a del 70 p or P53 mutation. Without those mutations, we actually had two choices. You only base your treatment on fitness, the less fit patients. Uh, well, you could argue that there were two options. One is a uh, fixed duration treatment, cell plus the CD20 antibody, rituximab or obinutuzumab, or abrutinib. And in uh, for fit patients, FCR or maybe BR in elderly patients that were fit. Uh, and that was actually pretty much the choice there was. And for P53 deleted or mutated patients, less fit patients, a BTK inhibitor uh, or the PA3. K inhibitor uh, CD20 plus minus uh, a plus CD20 antibody, which we know has quite some toxicity in first line with lalisib, or venetoclax monotherapy if patients were not suitable for B cell receptor inhibition treatments. That was kind of where we were until last year. Now we changed the uh, guidelines dramatically, and this is something I think it's important to discuss with the group of uh, listeners today. The question is, is this so, because we also see that the guidelines in the US are a bit different than we have now in the ESMO. Uh, and I'm not sure actually how you have it in the Saudi now. But how we do it now is it has been more complex. So if you have first line patient with advanced stage CLL, patient with symptoms, now you actually have three groups. One group is the group with P53 dysfunction. Now you have a group with unmutated IGVH or mutated IGVH. So although we had this marker, uh, from, uh, well, as I showed you from Terry Hamblin, 1999. It actually only now occurred in the guideline something that you have to do to base your treatment on. So it's not only the 70P, P53 anymore, but also the unmutated. And so what happens then? If you have a P53 mutation, you have two treatment of choices, either abrutinib or venetoclax plus obinutizumab. Abrutinib and venetoclax single agent is long-term treatment until progression plus obinutizumab might be able yourself to stop after 12 months or adelalisib rituximab. For uh, this group of unmutated patients, we have seen that in this group, the novel targeted agents are better than, uh, uh, than, than, than chemoimmunotherapy. So we think in this group of patients, abrutinib can be the preferred uh, drug of choice, but you can consider still chemoimmunotherapy since only in the uh, for FCR, a overall survival benefit have been seen, but not for BR or colorembicil or to obinutuzumab. Uh, unfit patients, we think you have two options, venetoclax, obinutuzumab or abrutinib. And I think you have together with your patients have to discuss whether long-term treatment until progression is preferable or a venetoclax, obinutuzumab regimen for 12 months. And a second option, chemoimmunotherapy, which you have a few options, either FCR for the fit and young patients or FCR, but preferably BR for fit patients that are older or for unfit patients, the chlorambicil obinutizumab regimen. And now it gets more complicated. So what to do with the pretty large group of patients that have a mutated IGVH and no DEL70P or P53. And it's a big debate. And I think here a very big deviation has occurred between the US and, and Europe. In Europe, we still think that those patients might very well benefit from FCR or BR or uh, chemoimmunotherapy. And as maybe second choice, abrutinib. And only after the uh, trial that is now uh, fully enrolled, the, the CLL13 trial, we will know whether uh, maybe new agents will be better than uh, this than the chemoimmunotherapy for the fit patients. In the unfit patients, you can say, well, there's not seem to not be a real advantage of netoclax obinutuzumab unless you can say, well, it's more mild and you don't, don't give any chemotherapy. But so far, no clear uh, gain in progression-free survival is gone here. Uh, so we think all these three options are kind of uh, equal. Uh, so that's what I want to end with. And uh, I think I'm not sure if you want to do Q&A now, uh, Chairman, or if you want to uh, postpone it after the talk of John.
uh, we will leave it uh, till the end. There is a separate session for Q and A. Okay, perfect. So I stop sharing. Thank you very much. It was an excellent talk. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Kator. So we're going to move to the uh, next lecture. Uh, it is my pleasure again to introduce uh, Prof. Uh, John Gribben. Uh, he is the lead. Um, he leads the Center for Hematology Oncology at Barts uh, Cancer Institute at the Queen Mary University in London, UK. Uh, he completed his doctoral studies at the University College London and continues his uh, postdoctoral training in medical oncology, then joined the faculty at the Dana-Farber Cancer uh, Harvard uh, Medical School, Boston. Um, he is an author of more than 500 articles, uh, chapters, and peer reviewed journals and publications. Uh, he was the founder, a founder member of the CLL Research Consortium and was awarded the, the Binet Ray uh, Medal for CLL Research uh, from the uh, International Wo Workshop in CLL in 2017. Uh, he served as an editor of uh, Blood Journal um, from 2007 to th 2014. He is the chair of the International Workshop on uh, Non-Hodgkin Lymphoma as well as the CAR-T. And uh, he is the current president of the European Hematology Association. So he will talk about uh, redefining disease control in CLL. So please go ahead, Prof. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Um, good evening, everyone from, from, from London here. So um, I'm going to continue on and where Arne was talking and give you a bit more detail in particular about the CLL14 data and the rationale for a fixed duration response. Um, this is part, of course, of the launch in Saudi Arabia of having approval now for Veneticlax in this way. Obviously, the meeting is organized by um, Abvi, and I have, of course, received honoraria for them, but um, as always, I receive honoraria from the other speakers. I'm going to be uh, sharing with you and talking with Arnon at the end end about uh, all of the different options available and how, how we can think about how this works to our patients. Oops, sorry. So what we want to think about is re redefining disease control in CLL based upon data Arna took through in terms of the clinical trials and are particularly focusing on um, CLL14. Sorry, the slides are just a little slow to move on. Let me, it's coming. And we've already had my uh, introduction. And here are my disclosures. I've already mentioned I do receive honoraria for AbbVie, but as you see, I receive honoraria from all the other companies that make these products too. So. I don't feel I'm in any way biased to one particular company or another. So um, as you've heard, um, uh, the new approval in, um, in EMA and now also in Saudi Arabia is that Veneticlax or Venclexta in combination with the Venetuzumab is indicated for the treatment of adult patients with previously untreated CLL. You'll also um, notice, of course, that venetoclax in combination with rituximab is indicated for the treatment of adult patients with CLL who have received at least one prior therapy on the basis of the previously released Murano data, and of course, we have quite a lot of experience of using that combination. It is interesting to note that although the CLL14 trial was in the elderly population, as I'll take you through and as Arz already mentioned, the licensing approval for Vodeticlax plus Vinatuzumab in, in the United States and in Europe actually is for the treatment of adult patients. So it is an option which is available for the treatment for, of our patients. So Arne has already taken you through the, the history of how we've evolved from an era where chemoimmunotherapy was our treatment of choice to patients to an era where the targeted therapies have come uh, uh, upon us. The BCR inhibitors, in particular, a bit of a calibrative, are very effective and good therapies. But what they, and they certainly, as Arne has already taken you through, provide increased efficacy over traditional chemoimmunotherapy regimens. But of course, they do require continuous therapy with all the problems that that involves. 
And Clexa-based combination treatments is a chemotherapy-free fixed treatment duration regimen with sustained progression-free survival off treatment. Deep responses are MRD uh, eradication and high CR rates, which of course allow there to be the stop of the drug and fixed duration therapy. And as I'll take you through in more detail, a manageable safety profile. So how can we achieve more for our patients with CLL? Sorry for the delay, it didn't work like when we tried it. So, uh, um, so the Clexta class-based combinations are the only chemo-free fixed treatment duration regimens and it allows multiple benefits. By offering a, a limited exposure to the drug, you allow your patients to have a fixed duration of therapy, a period of time off all therapy and off all treatment. Um, you allow the possibility for them to get back to their everyday life without having to think about taking a tablet every day. And of course, what we also have is a fixed cost. That is, we know the cost of starting with Lexa and Abinatuzumab for the one year fixed duration, as opposed to uh, Ibrutinib and Acalabrutinib, which are continuous therapy where the cost accumulates over time. So, as Arnon's already introduced to you, a venetoclax or inclexa is a selective oral first in class BCL2 inhibitor, and it's the only available licensed BCL2 inhibitor. It, ta it targets BCL2 overexpression and it helps to restore the process of apoptosis in um, the CLL cells. Anand's already alluded to this. I'm just going to go through it in a little more detail here. Um, we know that BCL2 is overexpressed in the vast majority of patients with CLL. We know it's overexpressed in a variety of other B cell malignancies too. What makes CLL rather unique among the B cell malignancies is that it expresses not only high levels of BCL2, but very high levels also of the BH3 only pro epitotic inhibitors. BIM, Buma, uh, uh, Puma, BAD, and NOXA. And when you have high levels of both of these, the, the pro-survival guardians bind the um, pro-apitotic initiates and protect the cells from undergoing apitosis. When we bind um, venetoclax um, to BCL2, we release the availability of these pro actors to activate the caspase mechanism through the cytokine. Um, cyt the cytochrome C pathway, the mitochondria. And it's this very high level of expression of these molecules in CL that makes CL so exquisitely sensitive to venetoclax. Now, of course, this is good in terms of it being a very effective agent that targets a halfway which and which these cells are vulnerable, but it also has the potential that we have to consider the risk of tumor lysis. And we'll come back to talk about that in just a moment. Because unlike other malignancies, when you um, um, sequester BCL2 with venetoclax, you have to be aware that these cells can rapidly undergo cell death, and there can be this risk of tumor lysis. And you'll see, of course, these, this mechanism is uh, separate from the B-cell receptor signaling pathway for which brutinib, calibrutinib, and lelucib um, uh, contribute. And of course, many of us are involved in clinical trials looking at the combination of ibrutinib or calibrutinib uh, with venetoclax, a very effective combination, of course, clinical trial setting only. I'm not going to talk about that evening. So the basis of the uh, approval was the CLL14 study, which Arnon has already introduced to you. This um, Oh, sorry, you just hate seeing the little scoping round. Here's the design of this study shown in more detail. So this was 
uh, a group of patients who were considered um, unfit to see chemo chemotherapy and therefore the standard of care in this setting would have been chlorambucil plus abinutuzumab. You'll see that the chlorambucil abinutuzumab arm in this study was slightly different from that which was um, uh, the Germans had previously done in the CLL11 trial, which was a short duration of chloramicil. And here, this was a, a, a one year duration of chloramicil plus abinutuzumab versus the abinutuzumab starting first and loading up with the abinutuzumab. The idea being first to decrease the tumor burden of the patients with CLL before you start the five week dose titration of, um, uh, from the um, 20 gram dose up to the standard. 400 milligram dose. Once that, that was achieved, the patients received five more cycles of binutuzumab and tiered 400 milligrams daily for one year. And at that point, um, the patients stopped treatment. So that's why we call it fixed duration therapy. The primary endpoint was progression free survival as assessed by the investigator. And important points for IRC assessed progression free survival, the overall response rates the complete remission rates and the um, MRD negativity rates at the end of treatment. So an important component of this study, as we've seen also in the Murano study in the relapse setting, was the MRD assessment was performed in peripheral blood at various time points during the study and continues to be monitored uh, serially every three months thereafter with the goal to uh, assess continuously are we able to eradicate minimal residual disease and how long does the minimal residual disease uh, stay away in this group of patients. The, um, so following these patients every three months um, for two years and every six months thereafter with a minimal residual disease assessment being performed uh, at that point. There were no statistic significant differences between the two treatment arms at baseline when we look at the venetoclax plus abinutuzumab versus the abinutuzumab chlorambucil arms. Uh, they were slightly older in this group, uh, but the, um, the um, BNA state was, was well matched. The tumor lysis risk category was, was well matched. Um, the creatinine um, clearance um, uh, being reduced was a bit higher in the venetoclax arm. Um, and the total SEER scores um, greater than six were again well matched, but slightly higher in the venetoclax abinutuzumab arm. Here you will see, and it's a little bit controversial as to whether patients with 17P should have been allowed into the study when you would think that we would not, from going through the ESMO guidelines, have been offering uh, in a tumorous rambulant to patients with 17P or P53 mutated patients. But be that as it may, that the study was allowed to go ahead, and that gives us, of course, this indication of what's happening. Again, you'll see a higher rate of T53 abnormalities in the setting of the venetoclax plus abinutuzumab arm. Arnon's already shown you this, and here we're now showing you the three-year progression for survival data. So this is an update of the data that, that uh, Kirsten Fisher originally printed, showing a three-year progression three point, uh, a, a statistically significant improvement in progression-free survival for the patients treated with venetoclax plus abinutuzumab compared to those patients who were treated with um, uh, abinutuzumab plus rambucil. Now, of course, in this graph, you'll see here what happens is the treatment is finished here, and this is the progression-free survival of the, the patients on venetoclax plus abinutuzumab who are off all treatment during this time frame. The complete mission rate was uh, significantly higher with venetoclax plus abinutuzumab compared to uh, chloramiso plus abinutuzumab, and more than twice as many patients in that R, or 50%, had a complete remission rate compared to the venetoclax and chloramiso um, R. The MRD negativity rate was also assessed and 76% of the patients achieved a rate of MRD negativity at the end of the combination treatment. And it's this high rate of CRs and this high rate of 
eradication of measurable residual disease that allows the therapy to be discontinued. This is what differentiates Viticlax from the, the, the BTK inhibitors, where we do not see rates of MRD eradication, do not see high CR rates, and are not able to continue the therapy. 57% of, of, of the patients had um, MRD negativity at the end of the combination treatment, and that's more than three times higher than we saw with chlorambucil and abinutuzumab. If we look at all of the subgroups assessed within this in terms of the secondary endpoints, you'll see that the hazard ratio favoured venetoclax plus abinutuzumab in all subgroups, and there were no subgroups in which we saw um, any benefit for using chemoimmunotherapy compared to the novel agents. In keeping with what Arne has also already told you in terms of moving away from chemoimmunotherapy towards more targeted therapy in more patients. Where adverse events, and of course here the therapy is given for the same fixed duration period, so we can look at the, 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 the uh, adverse event uh, grouping here. We do think usually of a, a chloramisole plus abinutuzumab as a safe combination, but you'll see that the side effect profile was quite similar. Uh, there was a, a slightly higher rate of neutropenia that occurred with uh, venetoclax plus abinutuzumab compared to chloramicil abinutuzumab, but that did not translate into a significantly increased risk of infection. It's likely because there appears to be a different mechanism of neutropenia associated with venetoclax that probably is more to do with the maturation arrest of neutrophils rather than true depletion the way that you see with chemotherapy. And often this, this neutropenia responds very rapidly to GCSF administration. And certainly that's my practice is to be coming in with GCSF early in these patients being treated with metaclax. We get the serious adverse events. You'll see that these are fairly well matched between the two groups. Infection rates, sepsis, slightly higher with venetix. Um, the infusion-related reactions, of course, that we see with the binutuzumab happening in both arms. Febrile neutropenia, again, fairly well matched. And, and thrombocytopenia, rather an uncommon side effect with, with, these, uh, with these agents. So in summary, a venetoclax or vinclexta is a selective oral first-in-class BCL2 inhibitor. It targets BCL2 overexpression and helps to restore the process of apoptosis in the CLL cells. The phase three CLL14 study that led to the approval of this combination in Europe and the United States and now also in Saudi Arabia, evaluated the efficacy and safety of that combination compared with um, abinutuzumab plus arambucil in previously untreated patients with CLL and with comorbidities. They demonstrated superior efficacy compared to um, abinutuzumab plus chlorambucil the sustained off treatment responses, the progression free survival to your estimate 88% versus 64%, the three year estimates 82% versus 50%, and the hazard ratio at that point now 0.31. The um, median is not reached in terms of venetoclax plus abinutuzumab versus 35.6 months with um, uh, abinutuzumab and clus. So, and you'll note this uh, progression of survival, uh, very comparable, in fact, better than we saw CLL11, and probably related to the fact that more chlorambucil was given in this setting. We do see these deep responses in terms of high rates of CRCRIs, uh, higher rates of MRD negativity, and it's these deep responses that allow us to stop the drug. This regimen demonstrated a manager safety profile in CLL, the most commonly occurring grade three or four adverse events, uh, receiving venetoclax in combination with venetuzumab or rituximab being neutropenia, diarrhea, or upper respiratory tract infections. And the most serious reported serious adverse events are occurring pneumonia, febrile, neutropenia, 
and tumor lysis syndrome. Now, tumor lysis syndrome was not seen significantly in the CLL14 study, but it was not seen because there was a very rigid adherence to the label of how to use venetoax. And when we're using it in CLL, we must adhere to the way in which it should be administered in the CLL14 study that involved starting with the abinutuzumab to debulk the patients, performing um, all of the steps necessary that AbbVie has put in place to safely administer an eticlac in this patient population. And using that approach, TLS was very manageable using this combination. So with that, with apologies for how long it took for each of those transitions, I'd like to thank for your attention. We go back to be very happily able to answer any questions that you have uh, with Arnon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was very uh, excellent presentation again and uh, timely. Uh, just on time, we finished. So before I open the Q&A, I just have a question myself to you, Prof. Uh, Gribben. Uh, do you think the CLL14 trial is uh, externally valid, meaning that uh, can we generalize the data or the result of that study to the rest of the adult population with the CLL? Like I know that it is approved for uh, adult population in uh, US FDA and Europe, uh, but uh, the study itself, the study population included the patients with comorbidities or elderly. So how can we scientifically uh, justify the use of this uh, combination and the rest of the group of adult uh, patients with CLL? That's a very good question, and of course many of us were a little bit surprised that EMA and FDA allowed the label to be so broadly applied that it was. Um, in Arnon's um, guidelines, you'll see that he is considering to sticking to the data that's already uh, published in terms of thinking about this for el more elderly population. What is certainly the case from our colleagues in the US and what we are seeing from those in Europe who are able to administer the agent is that patients themselves are asking for this therapy because they like the idea of the fixed duration. They like the idea of having a period of time off treatment. What I'd say is that what it does offers us an opportunity to be discussing with our patients what are their wishes and what are their goals in, in, in terms of, of looking to be treated. So it's a, it's a case of, of providing the patients with the data that we have, looking at the approaches that we have and thinking how important is it for the patients to have um, uh, to have that fixed duration therapy and how important is it to have a CR and a time of therapy. So um, we'll see. I mean, it's, um, it's interesting to see and one would expect that many of the guidelines will keep this approach to be based upon what was within the clinical trials. But one would expect to see increasing real life data for the more fit patients to be able to see uh, how well this therapy um, is, is, is tolerated and how well um, we see continued durations of therapy off the drug. The longer a patient can remain off the drug, the more attractive it is to use a venetoclax fixed combination compared to continuous ibrutinib or acalabrutinib. Fair enough. So we have questions here. So just going to publish the first one from uh, Dr. Majid Al Ahmadi. So, with grade three, four neutropenia of around 50%, I guess, with venetoclax, that is, uh, do you recommend the use of GCSF uh, with the Ven G combination? And if yes, how would you use it? Yeah, certainly I use uh, GCSF with this combination in patients who become neutropenic. Now, of course, 50% of the patients are not going to be neutropenic, but certainly. What I've seen is there is a good group of patients who become neutropenic with venetoclax who respond extremely rapidly to a GCSF administration in whom you're able to bring the neutrophil count up, up very, very quickly. Um, in other patients, you do require to use GCSF more commonly and certainly I've had patients who've been on um, GCSF maybe twice a week. And of course, in, inside the label, there are also instructions is that if there are continued um, uh, severe neutropenia, you can consider reducing the, the dose of the drug. I prefer to try to use GCSF and keep the 400 milligram dose going as much as possible. So I'd rather use GCSF than dose reduce wherever possible. Sounds good. So the yeah, next... only, can I comment on that? Because I, well, I still not 
I'm, I'm still a bit doubting whether it's more a cosmetic thing because you see so low numbers of neutropenic fevers and you can say, well, this is regardless the GCSF or maybe it's because of the GCSF, but because we don't see any mucositis, do you think, John, that it's really something, I mean, we should do it for safety, but more hypothetical, do you think it's more cosmetic or you think it's really something that we should worry about? Yeah, I, I think I alluded to it in the talk that we, it's certainly very clear that the mechanism of neutropenia um, is is very different with venetoclax than we see with conventional um, chemotherapy. It doesn't seem to be kind of a, a stem cell depleting approach that takes a long time. So certainly if you use GCSF, Arnon, you're absolutely right. You make yourself and the patient feel much better because you see the response to the GCSF very, very quickly. Um, I think we just need more data to be able to tell us whether or not it would be safe to leave these patients. And at the moment, in the absence of data telling us we shouldn't, I'm still uh, using GCSF fairly liberally with this combination. Great. So a question to uh, Prof. Cater. So when using chemoimmunotherapy for fit patients with mutated uh, status, is FCR superior to other regimens? Yeah, so it depends a bit how you define uh, uh, um, superiority. If you look to efficacy, we know from the, uh, also again from the German trials, FCR versus Bendamastin Rituximab from Barbara Eichhorst, CLL10, that FCR indeed gives a better progression free survival um, in the total group. Well, then a sub comparison has been done, but a lot of discussion has been always made because it was not something that was designed on forehand, it's like a post-study post uh, analysis. And there it was shown that the progressive free survival for elderly patients was more equal. Well, having said that, we also know if you look to toxicity, we know that FCR actually is inferior to BR or also to chloramicil obinutuzumab. So I think it really depends on the patient group. And, and now that you have this excellent second line treatment options, um, it's all a bit different now. I think still, if you can give FC, if you are considering chemotherapy and you can give FCR because of fitness and age of the patient, FCR is the superior treatment. But of course, again, you have to know how to deal with the fludarabine, with the not only the neutropenia, but also the T cell depletion for at least a year. Um, if you are fit, but a bit older, then the mastery is a very good option for also long-term progression-free survivals. And we have seen in the elderly that chlorambicil rituximab, but more so chlorambicil obinutuzumab actually gives an, 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 a, a PFS of, of a good, very good time frames uh, among two years. And we have seen that the time to next treatment is even longer. So I think you have three good options and you really have to look to the fitness of the patients which one is the superior treatments. So, so uh, there seems to be a consistent message from across several trials with the uh, benefit being greater in the unmutated uh, patients uh, with chemo chemoimmunotherapy compared to the mutated patients with the newer agents. So do you think that for the elderly people, say, uh, not like uh, the no-go kind of uh, population, but the slow-go population, do you think that BR is still a superior option for mutated patients uh, compared to the newer agents? Yeah, that's a good question. Um... I think that BR also for the slow go group, actually this, the, it, in the first, some strange has happened in the first line patient group, uh, BR has only been tested uh, at least for phase three trials in the fit patients, while in the a relapse setting, this, distinguished, this, this distinction has not been made so much and BR has also been given in kind of the slow go group of patients. But then you have to say that in those trials, the benamustine dose was mitigated, not 90 milligram per square meter, but 70 milligram per square meter. So if you have a slow grow group of patients, a uh, first line, which we're discussing here, I think benamustine rituximab, I would be very careful. And I think then chlorambicil obinutuzumab might be the preferred, uh, preferred options. And indeed, there it's something that's really interesting to discuss with your patient. Well, do you want to use abrutinib for a very long time? With also some uh, toxicities and and uh, but but I think they're manageable or then O treatment that John in much more detail has discussed, which actually also pretty good, very good actually uh, toxicities versus the six months of benamustin rituximab or clarimicil obinutuzumab. And I think for the unmutated patients, I think it's easier to decide to go for novel agents, and for the but for the mutated, I think there is still a case to make for clarimicil obinutuzumab. You agree, John, on that, or you think we should give Ben O also to the mutated patients? Yeah. Uh, 
good um, question. Well, of course, um, you see better outcomes uh, with venetoclaxib and atuzumab in mutated compared to unmutated. But it is a, a very good point. And I think, uh, you know, you said we'd maybe come back and talk about the Alliance study between us. Um, I think all of us were surprised by how quickly um, that study was able to read out. I think we all expected it would make up, take, might take much longer to see. And I think the thing we were really surprised by was how quickly we saw an overall survival advantage. Now, we haven't yet seen overall survival advantages in either the Lyon study or in the CLL14 study, um, but clearly that continues to be followed. And in my mind, once you get to the point of seeing an overall survival advantage, then it's clear that what the, the change that has to be made. But in, in my mind, there hasn't yet been a study in which the chemoimmunotherapy has even come close to the outcomes that we see with the novel agents. And I think they are more and more being squashed into a, a smaller and smaller group of patients. But if you're going to consider it at all, then the mutated immunoglobulin gene rearrangement patients are the only group in which I would now consider a giving chemoimmunotherapy. Yes, okay. We have a question by uh, Dr. Ahmed Al Askar. So, um, great talks from both speakers. Uh, so, assuming that tumor lysis syndrome is uh, due to the fast killing of CLL cells, have you noticed more frequent or intense uh, TLS with combination like uh, venetoclax and uh, obintuzumab compared to single agent venetoclax? So, um, well, the short answer is, of course, by the, the design of the CLL14 study was to use the abinutuzumab first. Now, in fact, in, there was a, a phase one, two study that was performed while the CLL14 study was ramping up that looked at giving venetoclax first and then abinutuzumab or abinutuzumab first followed by venetoclax. And what is very clear is that if you debulk the patient a little bit first using abinutuzumab, and in particular, it's the case that abinutuzumab very rapidly clears the circulating um, uh, volume of, of, of cells. That then when you start the ramp up um, a couple of weeks later, you've already debulked the patient to some degree. And then it does look as if it's slightly safer and with less TLS when you've already got less of a, of a, of a tumor burden. The issue then becomes, of course, um, you know, is it safe to go ramping up faster? And I, 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 my message would be absolutely not. You should still follow the absolutely standard dose escalation uh, approach because although abinutuzumab clears the peripheral blood, it has less of an effect on the lymphadenopathy and, and still there's a can be quite a larger tumor burden. So taking TLS seriously uh, and, and following the steps uh, and if you do that, I've said already that the combination is very, uh, very safe. Now, of course, in the Murano study, we start with venetoclax and then add the rituximab, so we do it the other way around. Um, and, and, and of course, we're all very familiar with how to handle venetoclax in that setting. So it's even easier to do it in the setting of the abinutuzumab. Nice. Uh, I guess we have two questions in the Q&A, uh, maybe two minutes, one minute for each. So there's a question here uh, about outpatient setting versus inpatient setting. Do any category of these patients need to be treated initially in the outpatient setting compared to inpatient setting? Yeah, if you look at the uh, the tumor bulk approach, so there's you can assess uh, low risk, medium risk, and high risk patients on the basis of the their degree of lymphadenopathy and their lymphocyte count. And high risk patients should be managed very carefully um, until you are very experienced in using that drug, this drug that should most likely be performed in the inpatient setting. You do require to perform uh, tumor lysis bloods at six to eight hours and at 24 hours afterwards. At our hospital, we have a hostel uh, on site and we have a hotel nearby that so we have the opportunity for even high risk patients to potentially be near the hospital but not actually an inpatient so but a little bit depends on what you mean by inpatient they certainly need very careful monitoring and you need a setup that enables you to be able to correct any abnormalities you see in during the period of the ramp up particularly in the first few weeks of the ramp up um, and if you are not experienced in using this drug and you have a high risk patient, I certainly would recommend admitting the patients uh, for each of the, uh, on the days of the ramp up uh, weeks, a one day admission each week. Yeah. 
Great. Clear. Any contraindications to Benito Clax? Well, I think what one is that um, page well, we, we have also in the Hoven group and also other groups have uh, after some debate uh, also given Veneto clocks to patient with a very low uh, claritin clearance until 30 and actually what we always have said we don't have data without that so to to continue on the point of John if you have a patient with maybe not bulky disease but with a decreased uh, kidney function uh, until a, a clearance of 30, you should handle those patients if, if they are high risk. So you do them inpatient with this very intense monitoring that John just said. I'm not sure, but I think I would uh, say it is a relative contraindication if you have really poor kidney function below a clearance of 30. You agree, John? Yeah, I, I was absolutely going to say exactly the same thing. So um, there were very few patients with a creatinine clearance of under 30 who are in the database. I think like like you, we are beginning to explore and see how we can manage those patients. And I agree completely with you, Arnon, that we would admit those patients and do it carefully. But I think it's a relative contraindication uh, to be treating a patient with a lower creatinine clearance than that. There's no data, there's no good data out there on how to do it, but more data will be accumulating over time for us to see whether it is possible to administer this safely to these patients or not, but they certainly require a special handling. Um, certainly also, um, very there, there are within the S, the, the label you'll find that with um, uh, ab abnormalities of liver function tests there are some recommendations for a potential decrease in dosing but everything is in the label and it's it's all it's all available based upon the pharmacokinetic studies that have already been done with this agent but it does appear that the number of contraindications to this drug is is really quite small. Great. I'm just going to ask one last question, Prof. Cater, if you allow me. Uh, so you, you showed us the algorithm for treatment for frontline CLL. Uh, and of course, very important to check the uh, TB53 aberrations uh, up front. How do you, be, do you go to um, test uh, TB53 aberration? Meaning that do you do uh, next generation sequencing or uh, Sanger sequencing? Uh, because we know in the beginning, it is not common frontline, usually about 10% or so patients to have TB53 aberrations compared to relapse setting. So how, how deep do you look at for... Uh, yeah, so that's a very good point. Um, the problem is if you go, the deeper you go, of course, the more noise you're also going to give, the more false positives you're going to have. And we looked at this in the Murano study, so an anticlock reduction map in a relapse setting. And indeed, it was seen that if you look to the very small clones, that actually the difference between BR... Uh, uh, so for the high clones, bendamaster rituximab was always a very poor outcome. If you go very low, then this trend is disappearing. So for now, I think I would still follow the, the, the international guidelines uh, made by ERIC, but also by, by other study groups. And that it's the cutoff of Zanger sequencing, which is still 10%. That should actually be the, the hallmark where you say, well, this is an official P53 mutation. And of course, since we're all clinicians, we should not only look to the numbers, but also if it's 9%, 8%, I think it's a bad, it's a bad group. But if you do NGS and it's actually clear below the 10%, I think we are still allowed to call that a patient with a uh, wild type P53. The reason I also say this is that we know that if you do see that chemoimmunotherapy fails in this group, uh, then you still have a very good uh, second line options with either the ven netoclax uh, based treatments or with the BTK inhibitors. Do you also look at uh, stereotype uh, subsets for CLL? Is that something incorporated in clinical practice? Well, so far, I think it's more interesting in the in the research setting. We always have seen that this VH321 family is indeed a poor outcome. And although the VH321 can be mutated, it completely behaves as unmutated. So that's, I think, the most important one. All the other ones, I think it is very interesting from a biology point of view, but not from day-to-day -day practice. John, you agree with that? Yeah, it's a, it's a, absolutely. Um, it's um, it, it's a, it, you raise an interesting point. Of course, is that when we do have the um, the results, do, do we ever think of uh, the high risk um, step, you know groups and treat them a little bit differently in your algorithm? It's not there yet. Of course, it's taken a long time, Arnon, for the immunoglobulin mutational status to get into the right. guidelines at all. And uh, at the moment, it's my opinion that yes, the stereotype subgroup is is uh, of interest from a research perspective 
to you know um, a, a group of CLL uh, physicians, and it will of course uh, start to appear more as more as the, the data becomes more widely available. I think once physicians start getting used to measuring and looking at the mutational status, more attention will be paid to what it actually means, and of course the mutated, unmutated, and even where the cutoff should be is, is a little bit artificial. And I think we may be redefining that once we have much more data available um, that, will, that will follow all of these patients that are being um, analyzed in this way. Excellent. So I would like to conclude by thanking both of you. It was really wonderful talk. Uh, thank you very much for the lectures. Uh, so we're going to announce uh, the next meeting, which will be next Saturday, September uh, September 26th, next Saturday, and it will be how I treat cutaneous T-cell lymphoma by Prof. Zinzani. So uh, please uh, be there, inshallah. And thank you again for everybody. Thank you for the sponsors and for the attendees and for the uh, professors uh, tonight. Uh, until next time, so we'll uh, see you again. Shukran. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.